shall roll when heaven's gates shall unfold. My Lord will be there. This evening? Amen. Number 42. Let's turn to number 42. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Let's all stand together as we sing. Saved by the blood. On that first together. Saved by the blood of
you're saved tonight and uh, it's good to be saved isn't it and uh, good singing this evening good to see you back in church on Sunday night looking forward to a good service together this evening let's open with a word of prayer shall we father we bow before you now tonight we do bow before you and ask for your blessing upon our gathering together here this evening uh, Lord you said when we gather together that there you'll be in the midst and so, Lord, we expect your presence here tonight, and, Lord, I would ask you to minister to your people this evening as only you can. Lord, I pray that the songs we sing and our fellowship together would be pleasing in your sight, and that, Lord, we would sing with melody in our heart as unto you. And, Lord, it would be a praise unto you this evening. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the decisions made this morning and for the good service we enjoyed, and I pray that you would do it again this evening. Lord, control every aspect of this service and uh, speak to our hearts tonight as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated. Would you turn with me to number 333 in your hymnal? 333. Three, three. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. Let's sing that first together. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's somebody up there, didn't it? <laughs> Brother Lindemann, I think you came off your chair on that, man. I just, woo, right up. The funny thing was, I looked at Dean, and he didn't know what's going on either. He's like, I don't know. Man. Just, uh, that was something else. All right. Hey, I uh, got a message from Brother Moreland uh, this morning. He had said he watched on live stream the service this morning, and uh, he said, by the way, in the stats you read for Bearing Precious Seed, they also sent 10,000 Armenian Bibles yeah. that they handed out the last two weeks. Ooh, and uh, yeah. they had 25 souls saved today in the services, six different services. And uh, once prayer, they'll be arriving at the airport at 4 a.m. their time, which is Monday morning, but 8 p.m. when we are getting out of church. Well, I shouldn't say we're beginning out, but 8 p.m. our time tonight. And um, so pray for Brother Moreland and everyone as uh, they travel uh, that was a safe trip. He says, I have a lot to share with you. Good stuff, good stuff. And uh, so excited about that. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing from Brother Moreland when he gets in. And uh, please uh, pray for him this evening as you go. All right. Um, right after the service tonight, we'll have a meeting of all those wanting to help or be a part of Vacation Bible School. It'll be July 6 through 9. And uh, we'll meet down in the conference room. So if you just gather in there right at the conclusion of the service, we'll uh, kind of get that organized and see where, where everyone will get plugged in. And uh, we'll be ready for VBS uh, July 6 through 9, all right? And um, then remember, Tuesday this week, we're going down to Bearing Precious Seed, and we're going to help put together some of those Bibles. And um, be here 8.15 in the morning. 
on Tuesday morning so we can leave promptly at 830 okay if you pull in at 830 you'll see the back of the bus is just pulling out down the road and you'll be driving to Milford okay uh, so and if you want to drive you're welcome to just uh, you can either go on your own to First Baptist Church of Milford or you can follow the bus or go together that's fine uh, some of you would rather uh, drive your vehicle, and that's absolutely fine. If you want to bring a lunch, bring a lunch, and uh, that's fine. Uh, there are many places to stop where there's a lot of different restaurants right in the same area, so people can have their choice. You can get something, or you can just stay on the bus and eat a lunch, whatever you'd like to do, uh, whatever you, you know, whatever suits your fancy, okay? But we want you to come. Don't, don't let any of that stop you from coming, okay? Uh, we got a good group going down there, and it's going to be a, it's going to be an exciting time. So that'll be Tuesday, and uh, so be here by 8:15, and we'll leave promptly at 8:30, okay? And then Wednesday night for the midweek service, right back here at seven o'clock. Wednesday evening, Thursday for the RU Inside uh, down at the prison. I uh, had 35 there on this past Thursday evening. They had a little difficulty with passes uh, that didn't get out on time, but uh, still 35 guys made it, and uh, we had uh, six that received Christ as our Savior. We had three men graduate the program and all through all four phases. And uh, one got a got a, the certificate because he quoted Psalm 1. The other two have to get Psalm 1 down uh, to be able to graduate. And so uh, good things are happening there with that program. And then, of course, Friday night, uh, RU. Uh, remember the church picnic next Saturday, July 4th uh, at Windsor Park. Uh, that's at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, 4 to probably about 7 or 8. And uh, we'll wrap things up, so uh, sign up for the, that down on the table. We'll have a good time together at the picnic on July 4th. And then next Sunday will be All-American Sunday. All right, we'll have a salute to the armed forces, and we'll recognize those who served, and we'll also have a state representation. Find out what state you are from, where you were born, okay? And uh, how many here tonight, you were born in a state other than Ohio? Okay, let me see your hand. Look at that. Woo! All right. Thank you. You can put those down. Now, we just need you back here next Sunday, okay? And uh, you be here to represent your state. And um, I hope you don't mean like the state of confusion or the state of something like that. But, uh, but I hope you meant a, one of the 50, all right? And uh, we'd love to see how many states we could have represented. All right. Looking around to see if anybody, anybody visiting tonight for the very first time? Anybody? We could, you got one right back here. Thelma, you have a guest with you. Why don't you introduce your friend to us? Okay. Okay, great. Jenny, thank you for being here tonight. Glad to have you. Appreciate you coming to the service this evening. Ushers hand you a welcome card there. If you'll take just a moment and fill that out, we sure would appreciate that. And a little bit, we have the offering. Just drop that card in the plate, if you would, and keep the pen as our gift to you for coming this evening, all right? And let's give this lady a warm welcome, shall we?
turn to number 11 in our hymnal number 11 long before the fall of man god designed a master plan he is mine on that first all together long before the fall of man god designed a master plan he text from Sally Spargrove this afternoon and said that she had been, you know, trying to visit churches and check out churches. She says, there's just nobody that leads music like Bob Reed. And uh, isn't that good? And uh, said just, she said half of them are dead or some of them are, are it's a woman song leader. And uh, she just said, just not, not working for her. So uh, pray, pray that uh, she'll find a good spot down there. All right. Hey, we have a couple of anniversaries to celebrate. And uh, they're today, and uh, June 28th, June 28th, 51 years ago, Jim and Margaret Talladay said I do, all right? So uh, Talladay's, and 35 years ago on June the 28th, Chuck and Cynthia Linderman said I do, and uh, how about that? Come on up, want to give you a card and some flowers, and uh, want to embarrass you a little bit and sing happy anniversary to you, all right?
Chuck, you didn't look like you enjoyed that at one bit, did you? <laughs> oh, amen. That's great, isn't it? All right, let's, let's keep singing together. Turn, if you will, over to number 316. 316. Satisfied. All my life long I had panted. 316. Let's stand together to sing it. Brother Bob will lead us. Another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing the last stanza together. so rich and free. Let's sing that last all together. Well of water ever springing, bread of life so rich and free, untold wealth that never faileth, my Redeemer is to me. Hallelujah, I have found him who my soul so long has Satisfies my longing through his blood I now am saved. Great singing. You can be seated. Great singing this evening. Let ushers are coming. We'll receive our offering now tonight. And 
give as God has blessed and prospered you and appreciate your faithfulness and giving right through these summer months all right let's pray we'll ask God's blessing on the offering tonight brother Andy lead us in prayer Speak to us through your word. Your word is truth. Thank you for a chance to give back to you what you've given to us, and that is everything, Lord. Help us to be cheerful tonight, knowing we're giving to the kingdom of God, and your kingdom is something that's never going to fade away. Um, what a privilege. What an honor. Thank you again for the chance to be here tonight. I just pray that you bless this offering, bless each gift and each giver, and we'll thank you and give you all the glory, for you deserve it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Take your Bible this evening, if you would, for our scripture reading. I'd like you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, please. 2 Timothy in chapter 3. Second Timothy 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. We'll read them responsibly beginning together on verse 1 and I'll read 2 and together on 3 until we end together then on verse 5 and then we'll also read some out of chapter 4 and I'll instruct you where to go once we're done with chapter 3 okay so as we usually do let's stand together to read the scripture all of us standing please to read God's word and let's begin together verse 1 2 Timothy chapter 3 ready this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. And then let's read the first five verses of chapter 4, and we'll read them the same way, beginning on verse 1 and alternating till we end together on verse 5. Ready? I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. <coughs> Father, add your blessing now to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Father, I pray that you would give us your help tonight as we look into your word. 
we know the Bible has the answers <coughs> and the principles by which we govern our lives. And Holy Spirit of God, I pray you would give each of us enlightenment this evening, that we would understand exactly what your word says on this subject matter that we address this evening. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill me with thy spirit and every listener with thy spirit and that the Spirit would bear witness to each one of us tonight that what we hear and what we see is the truth of God. So, Father, bless our time together this evening, and may it be profitable, may it be helpful. May you use it in each one of our lives. And I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I wanted to talk to you this evening and about what our response ought to be to the Supreme Court decision that was given on Friday. The Supreme Court of the United States decided on a 5-4 to four decision to grant same-gender couples government-sanctioned right to marry. Chief Justice Roberts wrote, each one of the four justices that dissented wrote a dissenting view, and this is a summary of Judge Roberts. He said, if you are among many Americans who favor expanding same gender marriage, by all means celebrate today's decision. Celebrate the achievement of a desired goal. Celebrate the opportunity for a new expression of commitment to a partner. Celebrate availability of new benefits, but do not celebrate the Constitution, for it has nothing to do with it. That's a, that's a powerful statement. But that decision on Friday, as many of you know, has divided co-workers, it has divided friends, it has even divided families. And how do we respond? How do you, how do you handle that situation? I'm not, I'm not, I, I think the response isn't to cave in and just, uh, as some say, we're just supposed to uh, love everyone and by that they mean accept everything. But the same token, we're not to get out of club and beat everybody over the head. Uh, That's not the answer either. In fact, our example would be Christ himself. He is always the example. And the Bible says Jesus came in John 1.14, full of grace and truth. And that's exactly how we have to respond, with grace and with truth. And the proper balance. Full means abounding, abundant, complete, and perfect. In fact... When they brought Jesus to Jesus one day, a woman who was caught in adultery, they said, in the very act. You remember that story. And once all the accusers were gone, Jesus having stooped down and wrote something on the ground, Jesus rode up and he rose up and he said, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And he said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. It's so easy to be on one side or the other. One group will champion truth without love, and another will champion love without any truth. When preachers preach truth without grace, it can do much damage. But when you preach grace with no truth, it does much damage. Sometimes pastors avoid the subject altogether, not wanting to be offensive or not wanting to hurt anyone. But it's awful difficult to obey 2 Timothy chapter 4 about preach the word and be instant in season and out of season and avoid the subject because it is something that needs to be dealt with. And whether it's in season or out of season, it doesn't matter. You know, our society likes to talk about our rights. But as a believer, it is not so much about our rights, it is about what is right. And that's what we're most concerned about. Don't be so concerned about our rights as what is right. And I wouldn't be able to say I love God or I love my neighbor if I just stay silent on this subject. Now, I want you to know my my aim is to be true to the Scriptures. 
We want to know what saith the Lord. As you may have, if you're on any social media at all, you know that everybody's got an opinion about it. I'm not interested in opinions. We want to know what God's Word says about it. And I want to be true to Scripture. I, I will not address every issue uh, 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 that, that this topic could come up with. That'll be impossibility, and we'd be here till midnight. We may be here till 11:30 anyway. But uh, we, and I'm kidding. It'll only be 11:25. But um, I understand that the issue we talk about this evening stirs up a lot of passion. I understand that for some it hits real close to home. I understand for some they they've grown up with family members that are homosexual, uh, relatives some with friends but they've dealt with it their whole life and it's very a very uh, when we make when we when we unknowingly and maybe even knowingly make unkind comments it hurts because they're still their loved one and they care about them and so i realize we've got those situations in our room tonight as well but there has been a huge and rapid seismic shift in our country regarding homosexuality. Some of you who are younger than 30 years of age would not necessarily realize it, though there's been a great shift even in the last 10 or 15 years. But those of us who are past 40 years of age or past 50 years of age, there's been a huge difference. In fact, The Economist ran a cover this past October called So Far, So Fast, in which the author said the moral revolution in America isn't just now taking, taking place, it's basically already been accomplished. Now, the Supreme Court has granted a constitutional right for what has been called marriage equality in our entire country. Currently, 60% of all Americans live in a state where marriage has been redefined and not coincidentally 60% around 60% of Americans have no problems with same gender relationships and by the way a recent study found that 73% of 18 to 29 year olds have no problem with What you don't know, probably, and I did not know, is that up until the early 1970s, the American Psychiatric, Psychiatric Association listed homosexuality as a mental illness. That was only 40, just a little over 40 years ago. You talk about a shift in thinking, a shift to where now it's completely accepted. But, but I want you to know, Christianity, even Christianity is dividing on this subject. But Christianity isn't, listen, the division isn't about homosexuality. Let me tell you what the division's about. The division is about biblical authority. That's what really is the division is over. Are we going to believe God's word or are we not? Are we going to take God for what he says or not? Let me give you a couple examples, and several of you, these will be familiar to you. Just in the last two years, the Atlanta fire chief was fired for his view that marriage is designed by God is to be between one man and one woman for life. Lost his job over it. Two Idaho pastors are facing fines and jail time for refusing to perform same-sex marriages. A professor from Marquette University uh, told a student that if he doesn't support gay marriage, then he's homophobic and should drop out of his class. You know the story of the Christian bakers, and there's been others since them that made headlines for refusing to make a cake. The cake for the homosexual couple that wanted them to make it, by the way, was a cake that featured Bert and Ernie and the slogan, Support Gay Marriage, written on it. And they have faced prosecution for that, and I believe faced a heavy fine. But, but what we want to know is, and what I want to help you with tonight is, what does the Bible say about it? What does the Scripture say? Uh, I'm not 
worried about consulting surveys or consulting the Supreme Court. I want to know what God says about it. And, and again, the main issue is biblical authority. And I'm gonna, we're going to look at the scriptures tonight, not to, not to twist them, not to modify them, not to try to take them out of context by any means, but to allow the authority of God's Word to communicate to us. And you have to understand, I almost did this handout for you. But you understand, there's, there's obviously two separate views on homosexuality. The world view, so to speak, and the biblical view. Okay? Now, just picture the two sides. The, the world view says, on the one hand, that, they're, that you are born that way. Can't help it. You're born that way. But the biblical view would say it's a learned behavior. It's a developed behavior. Okay? The world view would say homosexuality is an identity. It's who I am. And the Bible says it is same sex behavior and it is what you do. It is not who you are. The culture of you, the world view says it's normal and it's natural. The biblical view would say it's abnormal. Scotty, I don't need any help. Okay? People are here to hear what the Bible says and what I'm going to say. They don't need to hear what Scotty needs to say. Okay? Just listen carefully. The world view says it's normal, natural, and of course the biblical view says it's abnormal and it's unnatural. They say it's a, an alternative lifestyle, but the Bible says it's a destructive lifestyle. They say it's a civil rights issue. And of course the biblical view is it's a moral issue, it's a sin issue. And so let's look at what the Bible says. And if you're going to find out what the Bible says about a subject, a good place to start is at the beginning. All right, so let's go to Genesis 1. Genesis chapter 1. Get your Bible out and we'll look at it together this evening. You'll be turning to many scriptures tonight. Okay, so get your Bibles ready. We're going to look at the foundation of marriage in the Bible. And we know from Genesis 1, God created all things. And in verse 27 of Genesis 1, notice what the scripture says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so God, in the beginning, notice it says, Male and female created he them. So, and he tells them, he gave them a command to be fruitful and to multiply. Okay? That's all God's original design and intent for the man and the woman. All right? Now, in Genesis 2, you get a little more details of how all that happened. Uh, chapter 1 is the general overview. Chapter 2 gives you some details about how 26 and 27 uh, took place, or 27 and 28. The Lord God said in verse 18 of chapter 2, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which, was, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife." and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked in the man and the wife, and they were not ashamed. So the, the account of creation is really clear here, that God's original design was male and female. They call that heterosexuality, all right? A man and a woman. That was God's design for marriage. That's the, 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 that's the natural order of things. And by the way, 
they can replenish and multiply. Okay? That's God's design. That was his original purpose. Now, one pastor put it this way. Homosexuality must be seen as something outside of God's design for the human race. It represents a denial of the twofold nature of man as male and female. It's a deviation in the truest sense of the word. These passages in the beginning cannot be underemphasized. They cannot be overemphasized. They, they, they are vital to the understanding. To substitute a man for the woman or a woman for the man in this situation is to distort God's original design for marriage. God's original design for mankind. Now, I want you to understand, that is what is at the root of people who are behind getting the same gender marriage recognized. Let me read something to you from a fellow named Michelangelo Signori. He's a uh, homosexual activist. I guess he's on the radio, one of the uh, Sirius XM channels. And he, his goal isn't to get government-backed same-gender marriage so he can adhere to the marriage's moral code. Uh, they can do that without any government approval. Uh, he said, he said 96 per, oh, by the way, he says his goal, this is this Michelangelo fellow, he's written a book, and I can't recall the name of it right now, but he's written several books uh, to the homosexual community. He says his goal is to destroy marriage itself. He urges his fellow homosexual activists to fight for the same-sex marriage and its benefits, and then once granted, redefine the institution of marriage completely to demand the right to marry, not, of a, not as a way of adhering to society's moral code, but rather to debunk a myth and radically alter an archaic institution. Sneaky? Subversive? Yes. But he goes on to write this. The most subversive action lesbian and gay men can undertake is to transform the notion of, quote, family entirely. Paula Edelbrick, who is the formal legal director of the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, agrees. And she said this, being, this is, quote, being queer is more than setting up house, sleeping with a person of the same gender, and seeking state approval for doing so. Being queer means pushing the parameters of sex and sexuality and in the process transforming the very fabric of society. It, it fits in with the fundamental transformation of America. Here's the pattern. It was mentioned that we've joined 19 or 21 other countries that have approved the same-gender marriage. Norway is a country that has had same-gender marriage since the early 1990s, over 20 years. And illegitimacy is exploding. In Nordland, the most liberal county of Norway, by the way, where, the, where they fly gay rainbow flags over the churches, illegitimacy is soared. More than 80% of women giving birth for the first time do so out of wedlock. And nearly 70% of all children born are out of wedlock. Across the entire country of Norway, illegitimacy rose from 39% to 50% within the first decade of them allowing the same gender marriage. Anthropologist Stanley Kurtz said, when we look at Nordland, and he names another county of Norway, we're peering as far as we can into the future of marriage in a world where gay marriage is almost totally accepted. And what we see is a place where marriage itself has almost totally disappeared. Not just Norway. The same trend is in other countries. And the surveys show that a mutually enforced relationship between the same gender marriage and illegitimacy. Natural marriage is weakest and illegitimacy is strongest wherever the same gender marriage is legal. He goes on to warn that if the same-gender marriage is adopted, which it has been now, 
the claim that every child needs a father and a mother will probably be viewed as divisive and discriminatory, possibly even hate speech. And he doesn't have to be much of a prophet to predict that because Canada and Sweden already restrict speech against homosexuality to the point that even pastors have been jailed for quoting Bible verses. In the United States, the Democratic Party continually puts forth hate crime legislation, which will lead to the same result. It's only paving the way for the hate crime thought police to get here quicker. Regarding the situation in Scandinavia, Kurtz wrote this, Instead of encouraging a society-wide return to marriage, Scandinavian gay marriage has driven home the message that marriage itself is outdated and that virtually any family form, including out-of-wedlock parenthood, is acceptable. If marriage is not about children, let me ask you this, what institution is about children? The, one of the things that, 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 that's important in any society is the unit of the family. By the way, that's why the government got involved in the first place with giving marriage licenses. Because it was for the good of society, and they wanted to encourage couples to do that. It wasn't always that way. It was in the 20th, uh, early in the 19th, or 20th century, I think, before, United States, before the government got involved with giving licenses. George Washington was married without a marriage license. Abraham Lincoln married without a marriage license. There was no such thing. You just got a preacher and you got married. And uh, the, the, the government wasn't involved in that because it was a biblical thing. It was a thing between you and God. And, and the government got involved because of the good of the country and it was good for the people because it was good for society to have families. And, and a mother and a father who could... Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so marriage helps children and is good for children and gives them a good model of what their future should be. And the very future of children in a civilized society depends on stable marriages between men and women. We have enough problems already with illegitimate births in America. We don't need to make matters worse. And that's what this is. This is done. Now, again and again, the Bible will affirm the goodness and beauty of marriage between one man and one woman, and it consistently condemns the immorality of any type of sexual acts outside of marriage. Hebrews thirteen four says, "Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but a, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge." And that's whether heterosexual or homosexual. So let's, we're going to, before we come back to the Old Testament, we're going to come back there. I want you to go to the book of Matthew in the New Testament. Will you look there, please? Now you just, we remember the account there in Genesis where we talked, we saw God's original design in the beginning. Now I want you to look at Matthew 19. Would you look there, please? Matthew 19. Here the Pharisees are tempting Jesus. Verse 3, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So what did Jesus just do? He put his approval on that original design of God that in the beginning he made them what? Male and female. Jesus uh, puts his approval on the Genesis account of creation and that God's design for marriage is a man and a woman. And Jesus puts his approval to that and held up that Genesis account. And, and, and homosexuality, again, contradicts God's original plan and God's original intent. Now, 
Let's go back to Genesis, okay? And let's walk through some of the Bible examples, Bible passages on homosexuality, okay? Genesis 19. I'd like you to look there first. Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19, you have two angels come that, to tell Lot that they're going to destroy Sodom and to get him out. It says they, they, they came to Sodom at even in verse 1, and Lot sat in the gate, and of course he, he met him and bowed his face to the ground, and of course he asked him in verse 2 to turn into his house and stay the night, wash your feet, get up early in the morning, go on your way. And they said, no, we'll stay in the street. And he pressed upon them greatly, verse 3, so they turned in unto him and into his house, and he made them a feast, and he, he baked unleavened bread, and they did eat. And before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, and they called unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Lot went out the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out to you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only to these men do nothing, so for therefore they came under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn and he will needs be judged. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. The men, that's the angels inside, they put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door and smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. It's the first case here that we see in, in Sodom. And by the way, that's why homosexuality became known as sodomy. All right? Because these men came to know them, just like Adam knew his wife Eve. Same word, same, same account. And, and so the, 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 the men of Sodom were, were, were wicked before the Lord exceedingly, the Bible says. But I do want to set the record straight on something. With your finger there, well, we'll come back to uh, the Old Testament here again, but I want you to look at Ezekiel 16. Would you turn there, please? Ezekiel 16. Because I do want to set help you with something tonight that I've heard on many occasions, and I want you to be accurate. Ezekiel 16. In Ezekiel 16, by the way, look, look at me. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Because I may think that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their homosexuality. You believe that? Hmm? Okay. Here's what Ezekiel says, or the Lord tells us to Ezekiel. Verse 48. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me, therefore I took them away as I saw good. Now that abomination I believe you're referring to there would have been would be the, the sodomy. But that's not what he said first, is it? What's the very first thing on the list? Pride. And by the way, can I can I tell you that is at the root of it all? Is pride. That is the root of it. It's pride. In fact, when they have a parade, they call it gay pride. They call it pride. They're proud. And, and, and God hates pride. You'll never find pride mentioned in a good light in the Bible anywhere. Just, just, just get pride out of your vocabulary. It has no place. I don't even like it when people put on Facebook, I'm proud to be a Christian. What? You see? No, no, I'm not. Don't, don't say it. Jesus, even the Lord didn't look at Jesus and say, this is my son in whom I'm proud. No, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Tell your children you're pleased with them. Try not to tell them you're proud of them. Okay? 
just because, man, I just want to keep pride out. Pride is wicked. And that's the first sin that's automatic. And that, that leads to so many other sins. Pride was the sin of Satan. Pride is what threw him out of heaven. So it's pride. And so that was the root of it all. And then they take the one symbol that God gave that he would not judge the world anymore by a flood. And he set a rainbow in the sky. And they take that, they take that symbol and they use it as theirs. To me, it's throwing it up in the face of God saying, you won't judge us. But he will judge them. He will judge us. We will all stand before him one day. So be careful when you say, well, that's why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That's, that's one of the reasons. But it wasn't the only reason. And the root of the reason isn't the behavior. I think you're, you're hitting at the symptom. You're not hitting at the root cause. The root cause was their pride. And as the scripture says, their fullness of bread, and the abundance of idleness. By the way, is that America? Pride. Abundance of bread, or abundance of idleness and a fullness of bread. And by the way, not strengthening the hand of the poor and needy. That, isn't, that doesn't mean you're not trying to take care of the poor and needy. It means you're not strengthening their hand so they can work themselves. You don't strengthen the hand of somebody when you enable them. You strengthen the hand when you teach them to provide for themselves. And we don't do that. We enable them. And then... Then they went, they were haughty, goes with the pride, and committed abomination before me. And I took them away as I saw good. All right, now let's go to the book of Leviticus. All right, Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18. Are you okay? All right. Leviticus 18. Now, there's a list of prohibitions here, and, and I want to I make something clear. Sometimes people, in fact, I saw a uh, a post today on Facebook and people quoted different verses from Leviticus that well I eat pork or I wear a garment with mixed things together so I'm going to hell and, and you know they, they want to discard this listen these were laws that God gave to his people okay and, and, and some were for them that are not applicable to us now obviously uh, some of the very strict dietary laws that he gave to them but there is an important distinction and I'll show it to you here uh, as we look at Leviticus chapter 18 and verse number 22. Notice what the Lord says. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. It is abomination. What is abom And by the word abomination means extreme hatred or detestation. Something God detests. Now, he didn't just say... It's wrong. He said it's an abomination. And what is an abomination to God? He didn't say it's an abomination to you. There's sometimes you read through these passages and it'll say you won't eat this or you won't do this. That's an abomination to you. But God didn't say it was an abomination to him. What is an abomination to God is always an abomination to God. Because he's the Lord God and he changes not. So it's important to distinguish when you read through these what is an abomination to God because that doesn't change. The other things he lists, he'll list what, what they should do or shouldn't do, but he doesn't say they're abominations to him. Okay? The, he did say that you lie with a man as you do with a woman. It's an abomination. It's something God detests. God hates. Go to chapter 20 of Leviticus. He reiterates it here in verse 13. Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Again, Abomination is a key word. Extremely uh, uh, hateful to God. And you'll find other offenses listed in this chapter. 
like adultery and polygamy and bestiality and, and, and yet the prohibition against homosexuality is repeated as it was just a few chapters earlier. It's, it's consistent. God is always consistent. You'll see that as we look through the scriptures. Now I want you to go to the book of Judges. Judges. Judges 19. Here's a man who takes in a, a young prophet to his house, the old man to the young man. Verse 20, the old man said, be, Peace be with thee, however, let all thy wants lie upon me. Only lodge not in the street. So he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Now they were making their hearts, now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of this city certain sons of Belial beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that is come into thine house that we may what? Know him. We understand that terminology, don't we? These were men of Belial. These were men of the devil. And, and the same thing the men of Sodom said to Lot about the angels that came. And, of course, the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said, Nay, my brethren, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into my house, do not this folly. Behold, here's my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them will I bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good to you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. And there's a story behind that, and I'm not going to, this isn't the message tonight, but there's a, there's a lot of lessons to learn from that particular story. But it's simply to, to, to let you know that it doesn't end well. It's, it's a horrible story. It's a horrible for that concubine as well. And, and it's, a, it's a great example, as you'll see later on, what happens when people reject God's law and, and the slippery slope they go down and where it ends up. You'll see that when we get to the New Testament. Now, let's go to the New Testament. Look over in the book of First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 1. And, and it is amazing that people say the Bible doesn't say anything about homosexuality. Has anybody ever heard that? People say, oh, the Bible doesn't say anything about it. Sure seems like it does. 1 Timothy 1. Verse number 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. You see, Paul's saying here, the law was given to show us how sinful we are. It, was, it, it helps us see our sinfulness. The law makes sin exceeding sinful. And then the Bible lists those whose behavior has been uncovered by the law of God. Whose behavior, they've been busted, so to speak. Okay? Because God has written down His Word and written down His law. And, and part of the people He mentions here are them that defile themselves with mankind. And it's listed in some pretty awful company. Would you agree? It's listed in there with unholy and profane, murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers, whoremongers, them that defile themselves with mankind, men stealers, that's kidnappers, liars, perjured persons, some, some pretty bad company that it's listed in. Now I want you to go to your left to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Another mention here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, a New Testament reference again. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 
The church at Corinth had a number of immoral issues going on. And Paul is calling out some of the people there who were still living immorally, but thought they'd be okay. And that they were still in good standing with God, even though they were disobeying the law of God. Okay? Verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall what, church? Inherit the kingdom of God. He said, you're not going to live that way and go to heaven. Not You say, oh, that, are you judging them? No, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. This is what God says. And now, now I want you to understand something too. Notice the list. Fornicator. Does someone choose to be a fornicator? An immoral person? Yeah, it's a choice, isn't it? What about idolater? You choose to be idolater and worship someone other than God? What about adultery? Do you choose to do that? Yes, you do. When it then, then if you're effeminate or abuse yourself with mankind, then all of a sudden you were born that way. No, that must be a choice too. It goes with everything else in the list. Thieves, right after it. Thieves. You're born a thief? Huh? No, you, you, you make that choice. Covetous? Drunkard? You're born, you're born a drunkard? No, you make those choices, don't you? Okay? Revilers, on and on. So don't, don't say it's, it's, it's a choice. That's why, listen, I don't, I don't, don't I heard a guy on the radio today says, you know, just when, when you say that I won't do this for someone because they're gay, and, and I hate they took, they took that good word, but, but they, they, they took it and, and he says, just substitute the word black in its place. And they're trying to act like they're in the same, it, it's the same as being a, a discrimination against a race. You know what? You had no choice in what color you were born. You didn't have a choice. And so that, that doesn't wash. Nobody, nobody decided, I didn't decide I'm going to be born in a Caucasian family. God decided that. God decided the family you're born in, whether you're black or yellow or, or uh, white or brown or whatever it is. That, that, that was God's choice. You didn't have a choice in that matter. So all those are choices. And if you, if you listen, if these are the things you practice, this is the way you live, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. That's what the Scripture teaches. And that's, that's not just for that effeminate or abusers of the mankind. It's for the idolaters and adulterers and, and it's for the thieves and the covetous and the drunkards. It's for all of that that have broken the law of God. And, and you have to, listen, until you admit you're a sinner who needs a Savior, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It won't happen. Now let's go to really the most definitive portion in the New Testament on this, and that's Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Are you all right? You okay? All right. We won't be long. We're going to be finishing up here. Romans 1. In Romans 1, beginning in verse number 21, it says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools." and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than, than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. 
For even the, their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This is the central passage, as I mentioned, on homosexuality in the New Testament. He starts with, in chapter 1, the irreligious Gentiles. He moves on into the Jews in chapter 2 and 3, and he gets up eventually to chapter 3, where he concludes there's none righteous, no, not one, and that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and we understand when, when we, we talk about the sin of homosexuality, we're not talking from a standpoint that we don't sin. We, we understand we're sinners. But here's the thing. I'm not asking God to condone my sin. I'm asking God to forgive my sin. I'm confessing and forsaking my sin. I don't want my sin. I'm not asking God to embrace my sin and okay my sin. And what you see in Romans 1 is a society what, of what happens in a society when it turns its back on God. They become foolish in verse... They, the first, their heart becomes darkened in verse 21. They become foolish in verse 22. In verse 23, they turn to idolatry. And when you get to 24, it says, notice God gave them up. In verse 26, God gave them up. And in verse 28, God gave them over doesn't mean that God gives up on people, but you know what He does? He just lets you slide into depravity. We've slid there in America. We're there. In verse 24, the result is widespread lust. God gives them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. Then... The society spins out of control and goes into full-blown homosexuality. And God says, I give them up, in verse 26, to vile affections. And He says, the, notice the phraseology, the women did change, what's the next two words? The natural use into that which is against nature, which lets you know you're not born that way. You're born male or female. And, 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 by the way, that would go for Mr. Jenner, too. He was born a man. It, it, it didn't make... Well, I can't chase that rabbit right now, but I'll, 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 st I'll stay focused on this, okay? And uh, I'll stay focused right here. But uh, God uh, gives them up, and, and it's against nature. I am told in nature, among the other creatures that God created, that you won't find homosexual activity. It'll always be a, 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 fa a male and a female. Now, likewise, the men, verse 27, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which was unseemly. And the Bible says they receive in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. What's the recompense of error? Listen, there could be a variety of things. You, you can look it up and you can see that you can find statistics. It's easy to do and I'm not going to... I had a bunch of them and, and that's not going to cause anything. I just, I'll just say this. The, the, what I could find recently was the average 
uh, lifespan of a homosexual man, I think, is 42 or 45 years of age. A woman is about 48 years of age. That's all longer. And, and the, because of disease and other physical problems that come with, with leaving the natural use of the woman or the man. There, it is a destructive lifestyle. There's abundance of information about that. And with the crowd we have tonight, I won't go into what some of those recompense of the error could be. But, but God is clear in his condemnation of homosexual behavior. He's clear about that. And notice what he says in verse 32. Knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. And here's, here's an important part. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. See, listen, be, be, be cautious that God has given us a command here that not only are we not to partake with that, but we're not to take pleasure in people who do these things. Okay? And not to think that it's okay. It's, 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 and that's what's happening in the culture. They don't just want to practice their sin. They want everyone to embrace their sin and to approve of their sin. And we cannot do that. By the plain command of Scripture, we cannot do that. Someone said what's unthinkable in one generation is thinkable in the next and doable in the next. We've seen that come to pass. And let me say this, that God is not singling out, if you notice in these passages, He, he doesn't single out homosexuality as worse than any of these other sins. It's always in the list of sins. So he's not singling out one as any worse than, than any other one. Because they can be saved and they can be forgiven just as the drunkard or the thief or the adulterer or the fornicator. It's, it's just sin. And it can be forgiven. Widespread homosexuality is a mark that a society has forgotten God and rejected His Word. And in that sense, it's singled out for a special treatment because it's the primary symptom of a moral decay in society. And we're there. And we're there. So the Bible teaches that homosexual behavior in any form is contrary to God's will and is always a sin. For those who uphold the Bible, there can't be any other conclusion from that. No matter what our culture declares, or the courts decide. But there is hope. Go back to 1 Corinthians 6, will you? Go back to 1 Corinthians 6. This is the passage where we talked about some of the folks in the church who thought they could still fornicate, be an idolater, be an adulterer, uh, be homosexual, be a thief, be covetous, be a drunkard, and still go to heaven. And Paul makes it clear, you'll not inherit the kingdom of God. But in verse 11, notice what he says. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. Such were some of you. He said, but you're washed and you are sanctified and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, it's past tense. It's what they used to be. Okay? So, in other words, they were homo you were homosexual, but you've been washed from your sins. You've been sanctified. You've been justified in the name of Christ and by the Spirit of God. And you've been changed... And you're a new creature. And you're no longer homosexual. Just like you're no longer a thief, and you're no longer an adulterer, and you're no longer a fornicator. You've been washed, and you've been made a new creature in Christ. So don't, listen, don't buy into the lie that a homosexual cannot change. 
That's a lie of the devil. Yes, you absolutely can change. And Christ can change your life. When slanderers were saved, they became former slanderers. When adulterers were saved, they were saved, they became former adulterers. And when homosexuals are saved, they become former homosexuals. Listen, such were some of you. Change is possible through Jesus Christ. He can change people's lives. And he's still in the life-changing business. Deliverance and forgiveness is available through Christ. Now, let me give you some practical things about how we respond to this whole situation. Number one, for men and women who are married, you need to live out your vows and your responsibilities. It becomes ever more important that those of us who believe in the biblical design for marriage show the world what it's supposed to be like. We model it the way the Bible says we should. Number two, let's live with purity and let's watch our words and our actions. Let's stop the demeaning jokes and the unkind comments and malicious names. That doesn't help at all. And we need to stop it. Number three, we remember that everybody matters to God. You see, this idea that, that if, we, <clears throat> if we say that something's a sin, then we must hate that person. We'd, we'd hate everybody. We'd hate one another. Okay? We don't, we're not saying that. But listen, I, if, 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 I don't, if I don't approve of my children's behavior and I correct them, does that mean I don't love them? No. In fact, the Bible says that God chastens or He corrects every son whom He receives. If you're a child of God here tonight and you know Christ your Savior, you, at some point in your life, have been corrected by God. Because He said He chastens every son whom He receives. Why does He do that? Because He loves you. Why would we tell somebody that their behavior is wrong in the sight of God and if they don't get born again, they won't go to heaven? Because we love them. I don't want them to die and go to hell. I want them to be saved. And so don't, don't buy into the fact you don't love somebody if you tell them the truth. Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Everybody's a sinner in the eyes of God, and we are too. But I, listen, such were some of us. But we've been washed, we've been justified, we've been sanctified. And guess what? I want that for you. And we want that for everybody. Amen. Number four, pray for those who are caught in the sin of homosexuality. Pray that they would see their sin and confess Christ as their Savior. And find freedom. Number five, look for ways to introduce them to Christ. Christopher Wan, who was a former homosexual, said, God's unconditional love is not the same as His unconditional approval of our behavior. God has unconditional love, but don't interpret that as unconditional approval of what you do. It's a good thought. So I can welcome, listen, we can welcome sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. That's the whole thing the, the Pharisees accused him of. Is he just hangs around sinners all the time. That's who he came to save. Hey, that's who we're here to reach. And we want to reach out to them with the gospel of Christ. And we realize, number six, it's time to be saved. Everyone's a sinner. Everybody needs to be saved. God's angry with, with sin. And by the way, God's angry with sinners. The Bible says, you don't believe in Christ, the wrath of God abideth on Him. 
Be careful about that cliche we always like to hear. Well, hate the sin, but love the sinner. Be careful about that. We, we are to love the sinner. And we're to give them the gospel. But be careful. Don't say that God's never angry with sinners. The Bible says He is. But that anger, by the way, that anger was placed on Jesus Christ when He died on the cross. That wrath came down on Jesus when He took our place. Now, when I receive Christ as my Savior, He becomes a propitiation. He satisfied that, that wrath for me. And I won't have to endure that wrath. And you won't either. But if I reject Christ as my Savior, and I reject the, the, the teaching of the Bible that I'm a sinner who needs to be saved, then I will have to endure that wrath. God's wrath will be poured out on me. And it will be poured out on all those who reject Christ. So... We ask them to repent. Can I say this? The opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. It is holiness. Holiness. That's what all of us are supposed to be. God's goal is for our purity and for our holiness before Him. The only way for somebody who's struggling with this sin of homosexuality. And I think it's such a misnomer because so many that struggle with it, you know, the last thing they are is gay. The last thing they are is happy. They're, they're, they're struggling. Just like anybody who struggles in a sin. Just like you were before you got saved. It was, it was a miserable... There is no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. Boy, you were, you, you were struggling. And it can be any, anything in the list of sins and maybe nothing that was listed here. But you're, you're struggling. And listen, our job is to show them that God loves them. And God can save them. And God can forgive them and cleanse them and make them a new creature in Christ. And God can change your desires. He's not called us to hate people. He's called us to love people. So our mission stays the same. Preaching the gospel, repentance toward God, and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. See, don't, there are, that's, that's what the Bible says about the homosexuality. I get grieved. I just saw a post today that somebody put up, a, a guy who I know, and put up about a, and some of you may see it on Facebook, about a, a pastor who says the Bible doesn't say anything about the consequences of homosexual behavior. I don't know how people can put that up. And then he likens the fact that we all have sins too, and so we just need to love everybody. We do. We all have sin. But there is a difference when we're confessing our sin and trying to stay away from our sin and asking God to forgive us of our sin, and asking God to overlook our sin, and take me anyway, or change the Bible to say it doesn't say anything about it. And again, God's not singling it out in that way in any of these lists. It is a choice. We follow, hey, every one of us have, every one of us have wicked hearts heart is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Deceitful above all things. There's nothing you could name that's more wicked and deceitful than your own heart. Everybody in this room has desires that are wicked. But you, listen, we don't follow them we don't want to follow them we try to crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts lusts are those strong desires we want to die to those why because it doesn't honor God so we don't act on those desires see and the world just looks at and says boy if that's your desire that's what you ought to go for no that's not biblical we're admitting, we say, sure, those are desires. 
but they come from a thing that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So don't follow it. What do you need? You need a new heart. You need a heart transplant. And God can give you one of those. Amen? All right. Kept you long enough. That's our response to what the ruling was on Friday. Let's reach. Hey, they're, they're in our world. How many of you, let me just see something real quick as we close. How many of you know someone that is homosexual, either co-worker, family, friend, relative? Look at that. Yeah? You need to reach them with the gospel. Show them the love of Christ. Not, hey, how many know somebody who's uh, alcoholic? Okay? Look at that. Just a minute. How many know somebody who's got a drug problem, a stubborn habit of drugs? Huh? Look at that. See? It's, it's no different. What, what do you want to do to try to help them? Give them the gospel. It's the answer. He's the Savior. He's the life changer. We want to get him to Jesus. All right, let's stand together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer. Lord, I thank you for the attention of everyone tonight. We, by nature, had to take a little longer to deal with this subject. And, Father, it's, it, it's not all... Uh, not, not anywhere near exhausted. But Lord, I, I, I pray that folks have a handle on what your word says about homosexuality. God, I would ask you to forgive us in our country for our wicked behavior. And I realize that a great deal of responsibility lies at the door of the church house. We have not been the salt and the light that we should be in this world and certainly in our country. To hold back the corruption, to expose the corruption of this world. Father, I pray that we would do our best, as these many hands indicated tonight, to reach these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would have testimony of your grace testimony of your saving power to change people's lives. Such were some of you. Lord, I pray that we would hear some testimonies in the weeks and months ahead that of homosexuals who've been saved and their life changed by the power of God. Use the people in this room to witness to them. And God, help us to be cautious that we do not take pleasure in the things that was listed here in Romans 1. The Lord, we don't stand against this immoral behavior of our society and the, the, the slippery slope that goes with the uncleanness and the immorality. And then we go inside our homes and we secretly watch it on our televisions and on our DVD players, on our computers. And secretly we're taking pleasure in God, forgive us and help us to be pure, to be holy, to be pleasing in your sight. Lord, help us to love people as you would love them. Help us to have the right mixture of grace and truth as we give people the gospel of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and I'm going to finish this prayer in just a moment. But I do want to have a brief invitation this evening. I think that some in the room tonight who know people that are caught in this particular sin ought to take this opportunity to come and kneel at the altar and call their name in prayer and ask God to save their soul. Ask God to help you to show love to them and to reach them with the gospel of Christ. I don't want to give you that opportunity this evening. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless this invitation. You'd hear our prayer tonight and that our lives would be such a testimony of the power of God that those caught in whatever the sin is, whatever the stronghold that Satan has got in their life, realize there's hope in Jesus. 
they come to know him as their personal Savior. They'd know freedom. For if the Son will make you free, you'll be free indeed. Yeah. Father, hear our prayer tonight, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, the pianist is going to play, she's going to play, Bob's going to sing. The altar is open for you to come and pray this evening. Spend some time with the Lord. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever right. love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender humbly at His feet. I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me Jesus, take me now, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine, let me feel the Those of you who are willing to help us in VBS, would you meet down in the conference room right after words? We'll just write down areas we're going to need help in and assign you where you're going to be and talk a little bit about that. That'll be in the conference room right after service, okay? Even if you haven't signed up yet, just go down there. We'll sign you up, okay? Need, need some help. Got to have workers. Uh, it's 6.30 to 8.30, Monday through Thursday, okay? Uh, July 6 through 9, okay? All right, let's pray together, shall we? Father... Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you, Father, for the people of God in this place. And thank you for their attention to your word this evening. Lord, I'm asking you to hear the prayers of your people tonight. And our prayer, Lord, that we could impact our, our area and our state and our world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to live lives of holiness and purity so that we can have your blessing upon our lives and your power be evident in our life. 
Lord, I pray that you would use us to preach the gospel of Christ and to set the prisoners free. Lord, I pray that we'll see many souls come to know you as their Savior and be freed from sin as a result of this study here together this evening. Lord, we love you. I pray for Brother Ron and his group as they board the plane now and begin their trip back home here to the United States. Please watch over them. Give them safety. Bring them back home to us, Lord. And we rejoice in your goodness to them in this trip. And I pray you'll continue to guide and direct their steps. Dismiss us now with your care, please. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it together, all right? It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.